Welcome everyone. And uh, we are excited that you're here joining us. My name is Michelle Dibley. I'm the program director here at Washington National Cathedral. If you're just joining us and hearing my voice, we would love for you to drop your name and where you're from in the chat so that we can see the range of people and where you all are joining us from. We know that folks come from all over the country and sometimes from other countries to our Sunday morning worship and to our evening programs as well. You'll also see a poll that's up on the screen in front of you. If you've joined us on your screen, we'd love to learn a little bit about who's joining us tonight. So that poll will stay up for a couple of minutes here. So the other thing that we want to make sure that folks know as they're coming in is that we'll be asking some of your questions of our panelists tonight. We'll do that towards the end. And you can at, let us know that you'd like to ask a question by clicking the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen underneath what's now the, the picture, the pictures with the title of tonight's event. So there's two thought bubbles with the words Q&A underneath it. And if you type a question in there, then uh, Margaret and Caitlin, who are staffing us uh, in the background tonight doing all the logistics, will make sure that those questions get to uh, Ken and Leonard Hamlin and I as your co-hosts. And um, we'll get a couple of those questions out to the folks who are here to join us. We are unfortunately not live on Facebook tonight. There have been some spam problems with our account. We are waiting for Facebook to fix them. But until that point, uh, we are going to protect you all. Apparently what they're after is your credit card information. So we wanna make sure that we are not actually allowing <laughs> the bots to, uh, to grab that. So we'll be here on Zoom tonight. This program will be archived on our YouTube site, youtube.org slash WNC, that'll be up tomorrow. And then we'll premiere on Facebook probably tomorrow, assuming that it seems um, that safe to do that. So um, folks who are joining us, thanks so much for uh, adding your information into the chat. We'd love to know who you are, where you're from, if there's a particular reason that you're here tonight as well. And if you have a minute to, um, Take a look at our poll, that would be great. I see that the Reverend Canon Leonard Hamlin has joined us tonight, and, or just now. He's my co-host, and I think that means that we are getting ready to go, and our panelists will be on screen in just a minute as well. So we are wanting to make sure we get started quickly. Welcome, here we are. All right, all four of you are here. Uh, so the official welcome. <laughs> <laughs> will now come. So again, my name is Michelle Dibley. I'm the programs director here at Washington National Cathedral on behalf of Dean Hollerith and uh, Bishop Buddy and uh, the rest of the staff and supporters at the cathedral. We're so glad that you're joining us. We have uh, four fantastic speakers with us tonight. I'll say more about them in just a minute. Um, a, little, a word of introduction about the cathedral. We are a place that convenes conversations that we feel are important to the nation and important to our communities. And we hope to do so with a spirit of dignity and with respect, and also with honesty and integrity. So there's a chance that if our group here is as diverse as we hope they are, and as our, if our, those of you watching are as diverse as we hope you are, you might hear something that makes you uncomfortable or that is new or that you're curious about. And so we ask that you come and listen and be curious and with an open heart. We ask the same of ourselves as co-hosts and of our panelists. So the way through is to listen and to have conversation and to make sure that we're, uh, we're tending to one another. So we're gonna do that here tonight. And with that, I will, one more reminder, we'll move to questions from you all at the end of about 40 minutes of conversation. There's a Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. Feel free to feed us a question. Thank you to Margaret and Caitlin who are working in the background to keep this all going smoothly. And I think, um, I think that's all my announcements. We are not on Facebook. We've had some spam bot problems, so we're avoiding those. And we will be on YouTube tomorrow night or tomorrow with this program. So to introduce our fantastic guests, and then I will turn it over to my co-host Leonard Hamlin. I'm just going to go in alphabetical order because I can't pick favorites. So Mr. Rashern Baker is joining us from Prince George's County. He's the um, was the county executive there from 2010 to 2018 after serving for a number of years in the Maryland House of Delegates. So we're so pleased that you're with us tonight. 
Mr. Frederick Davey, an executive vice president from Union Theological Seminary with loads and loads of nonprofit experience, government support experience that I hope he will share some of uh, with us tonight. Um, most particularly in terms of this conversation, he is the chair of the Civilian Complaint Review Board, which is a, a, an overs a citizen oversight committee in New York City that has oversight of the New York MPD, which is the largest municipal law enforcement organization. So he'll have some things to share with us about that. Um, mayor Betsy Hodges uh, hails now from DC, was the mayor of Minneapolis from 2014 to 2018, uh, during which there uh, was some particular unrest around policing, um, which she will be sharing with us tonight. Now a resident of DC, author, writer, and speaker. And um, finally, our, uh, Sharon Pratt, Mayor Sharon Pratt, uh, who is both a member of the Cathedral Congregation who worships with us regularly, as well as the mayor of DC um, from 1991 to, I believe, 96, although I forgot to write that, <laughs> that date down. Um, she's currently serving as the founding director of the UDC Institute of Politics, Policy, and History, was appointed by Mayor Bowser to that position as of 2019, and also have, has loads of other experience beyond that. So I'm going to hand it over to Canon Leonard Hamlin, who is my co-host, who I'm pleased to serve with for an opening prayer, and uh, then to get us started with our first question. I'm going to stop talking for a minute here. Certainly, I want to join with our programs director and, and welcome our panelists and for all who have uh, come together and joined us online this evening. And so we're looking forward to a wonderful evening, but we'd like to invite you in this moment as we open all of our programs with a word of prayer. And so those who are inclined to join me, I invite you to join me in a word of prayer. And I'll be sharing on this evening just a portion or some parts of a prayer uh, that was written shortly after uh, the death of, we know, George Floyd, um, that has brought us perhaps into this moment and other moments. So why don't you pray with me? Father God, sometimes I think the most infuriating thing about injustice is the absence of the acknowledgement of wrong. And as we gather this evening, we pray that we might not simply acknowledge, but we might vision, vision the future. Thank you for the many police, government officials, and everyday citizens that are acknowledging a need for change. May this acknowledgement continue to move across the country and may it be followed up with action. So we pray for growing acknowledgement of all of the ills that exist in our country. And let us grieve that truth and let us advocate for change. But we know that change starts with our hearts. So please open our hearts so that we may see people the way you see people and love people the way you love people. This is our prayer, amen. Amen. <clears throat> As we begin this evening, let me once again say how, what a wonderful evening I'm looking forward to um, and sharing this evening with our panelists and our program director. But we're gonna make the most of the time as we know there's a lot on the schedule for tonight and, and many are looking forward to uh, even moments beyond our gathering this evening. So I want to pose uh, our first question, uh, beginning with a statement and a question, that just as I've lifted in the prayer, many are acknowledging right now that injustice is present within our society. Um, and there are many who are looking for hope and uh, they're talking about hope and looking for change, um, but they don't know what that looks like. And we all bring something different to the table, even when we are working what we call towards the same goal. And so I'd like to begin with a question this evening because we know we're in this, that we might work for a brighter day and uh, that you might share and give us information and understanding that will help us have tools and, uh, and further understanding to work on this. But we'd like each of you to tell us 
what a just society would look like from your perspective, your experience, or perhaps as you would express it, what you'd like to see as a result of your own work and efforts as elected officials and knowing some of the issues and the challenges that we may not see. And so let's go perhaps maybe in that same alphabetical order. I'm gonna ask Mr. Baker, won't you lead us off? Well, thank you. And, and thank you for, uh, for having us here this evening and for the conversation the other night about these important issues. Um, you know, I, I thought about the question, you know, a just society. I think for many of us, I know for me, that's why I got into public service in the first place. Um, I had decided at 17 years old that I had lived a life that um, my relatives, you know, who were living in inner city didn't have the same benefits, that I was not a particularly good student and uh, got in a lot of trouble, but I had parents and teachers who undergirded me and made sure and never thought I, I wouldn't go to college. And so I boiled it down at that point, you know, I felt, as I tell my kids, I felt really guilty about the fact that I had squandered so much opportunity that's given to me, and yet I could still rebound from it. And so what it said to me about injustice is I wanted to make sure that every body that I could do and, and, you know, could come in touch with would have the same opportunities that I had simply because I was blessed, but they would have it by right. Now I have to give credit to, uh, you know, Tony Blair later on said the same thing. Um, but that's really why I got into uh, public service really was to make sure that uh, we do have a just society, which is everyone has the ability to live up to their God-given talent without restrictions. And that's what motivated me then and motivates me now. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Oh, thank you. And again, I want to thank you also for uh, uh, um, organizing and presenting these conversations. I had the good fortune of sitting in on the one, um, I guess it would be Tuesday night now, and was very inspired by that conversation. And so I feel it a privilege to be here to be a part of this conversation tonight. So for me, when we talk about sort of what would I, what would a just society look like or what would I like to see in a just society, I would start with um, a preferential option for the poor and the marginalized. I think if we can decide fundamentally that we're gonna be concerned about those people who live at the margins of society and who don't have the resources they should have to live, that would be a good way to organize and orient ourselves toward justice. And then in addition to that, just a, some practical things, I'd like to see everybody have a, a, a baseline income. I, I think in, in the wealthiest society in, in the country, it's unconscionable that uh, there isn't a basic income for everyone. And I know that there are conversations about how that'll lead people to be lazy and not work. I don't buy that. Um, I think there are some examples that don't necessarily bear that out. But I do think, I mean, I agree with Andrew Yang here that a, a basic income for everyone is extremely important. I would add to that, uh, and I don't want to sound like a politician, but, uh, uh, but, but Medicare for everybody, at least the opportunity to have health care and not have to worry about those, that kind of basic basic um, uh, need and right. Um, and then I think I would love to see us all um, acknowledge um, our prejudices and our biases um, in, their, in their various forms as it relates to other people. And then the work to try to move beyond them. But I think the first step is simply to acknowledge them. And I think many of us in our various spaces in society and in, in, in our culture assume, whether we're on the left or the right or in the middle, that uh, prejudice is, and bias is something that belongs to other people. Uh, but we all have it. And some of us have it more intently than others. Um, and we have it around different things or different uh, uh, characteristics that people or, or identities that people bring to the table. But I think it's, if we're ever gonna move beyond these 
prejudices and biases that hinder us, then it's really important for us to acknowledge them. So those are some of the elements that I'd like to see um, in a just society. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll be quiet and let my fellow panelists speak. Yes, uh, Mayor Hodges. I would also like to start by saying thank you to you and to the National Cathedral and to everybody watching now and in the future for being here and for this opportunity uh, to talk about uh, basically the, the spirit of our community. Uh, it, we might be talking about policing tonight, but it comes down to who are we as a people and who do we choose to be. And my vision um, of a just society, I think the modest vision is uh, especially of a racially just society is where we can't predict people's life outcomes by their uh, by their race, by their current by the class background they're born into, uh, that those things become non predictive for life outcomes, and that everybody's basic needs are met: food, um, water, shelter, access to medical care. Uh, that our basic needs are met because that fosters the full flourishing of our humanity and our spirits. And I would add to that that our systems are set up for that, that our systems are set up for the flourishing of humanity and people and our spirits and not set up uh, to, for wealth and power for uh, a, a, a very few people, that our systems are set up for people to do well, not for most people to do poorly. And that's Sometimes I think of that as the modest version. Um, I, I think the, the even bigger vision than that is that the full flourishing in a just society, it's, it's, it's set up for the full flourishing of the human spirit and the full flourishing of our human genius and the full flourishing of, of who we can be individually, but also as a community and as people. That we set up our world for that and it encompasses those things i just mentioned but it's also a complete revision of how we imagine why we come together as people um, and why we're here on the planet thank you and mayor pratt please well i would almost i would endorse everything that's been said i like what uh, mayor hodges just said that you know what the outcome the path your life takes is not determined by your race or color or faith, et cetera. But I would have to say that I wanna to speak to one step that I think we have to take to move us closer to that justice. I think in this country, that would be to deal with America's original sin. Now, America is an aspirational country. It is a beautiful country because of that. Uh, but it is clear that we have uh, failed a great many segments of our society, but nothing was as egregious, at least from my viewpoint, than the original sin of slavery that lives with America today, which is why you actually have to have a group that says Black Lives Matter, which some people take offense at. Oh, all lives matter. But the fact that you have to say Black Lives Matter is the point, because Typically in America, black lives have not mattered. And even though slavery ended after 250 years, then there was Jim Crow and we cannot ignore how the popular culture reinforced mm -hmm. notions of who is worthy, who is competent, who should be really embraced by our society. And I believe that if America ever really genuinely, authentically addressed this issue, actually addressed it. And in this capitalist system, that would mean there would have to be some reparations or whatever you want to call right. it so that you begin to make an investment in these communities. Then I think if we ever dealt with this in the way South Africa has had to deal with it, I think we could move to embracing a world where we actually did see everybody for their inherent worth. So that would be my thought but a step towards moving towards a just society. Well, thank you all for, for that. And um, Mayor Pratt, I so appreciate you uh, sort of shifting us a little bit into where are we going, right? Because we can dream all day. It's so, it's <laughs> one of the things that 
love about the way we're setting this conversation up is that um, it's, as Ken Hamlin said, it's easy to talk about what we don't want. Um, it's sometimes a little harder to imagine, envision where we want to go and, and what it'll take to get there. So Mayor Pratt, I actually want to stick with you for just a second because um, one of the things that came up on Tuesday night that I think um, you and you spoke about in our, our prep is the notion that our policing system actually has its roots also in, in enslavement and in that um, the role of law enforcement to continue to contain, capture, and enslave human beings. And so to shift our conversation a little bit to tonight's topic, I'm wondering if you would be willing to say a little bit about, um, if you want to expand on that, uh, please do. And then also I think the question about a what does, what does law enforcement in a just society look like? There was real agreement last night and I hear on Tuesday night, I hear it tonight too about um, the opportunity to thrive, right? Become full human beings. And I think there's agreement that the way our policing system works right now um, prevents that for a, a significant number of people in, in, in ways that are both fatal and also traumatic and, and sometimes not as, as direct as that, but it's problematic. So, well, I don't know that it's inherently the nature of the criminal justice system. It's certainly there to the extent that our sentencing law have very much, you know, forced severe sentencing when, the, 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 you know, the, the crime did not justify it. And that certainly has significantly contributed to the numbers of particularly African-American men and men of color uh, in our criminal justice system in a way that really... Uh, is outlandish compared to the rest of the world. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a balancing act, you know. I mean, at the same time, I was the mayor, the height of, of uh, murders in Washington and uh, a crack, co you know, cocaine and gangs. Uh, and there were the people who were most hard hit by this were African-Americans. I mean, they were the ones, their kids were the ones who were getting shot paralyzed for light of life if they actually survived the, the gunshot. Uh, and we're desperate for us to bring some discipline into their community. Uh, but the cycle of why people got caught up in that and further the attitude towards particularly men of color in that system is what made it worse. But I don't think it's inherently, and I know Black Lives Matter would probably take exception with my point of view. I don't think it's inherently the system. It's such a much bigger issue and it plays itself out in that system. Thank you. Uh, let's keep going with that. If other folks want to jump in around um, what, I, I, and particularly the question of what is a, what does policing look like to get us to a just society? Right. What would need to what would need to happen? And I, I, I agree. I'd love to be able to hear from um, everyone in, in that what to identify, as she said, what needs to change? Uh, you've been there. You, all of you were there. And, and now you're sitting on the other side. Please help us a little bit from your perspectives about what needs to change. Yeah, if I can just say, <clears throat> I, I agree with, um, you know, Mayor Pratt, I think um, just like she did. When I came into Prince George's County, um, we were under a Justice Department dissent decree because of police brutality in a place that had a long history of police brutality against African Americans. Um, but we also were experiencing the biggest increase in homicides that we had ever seen. And as a new county executive, I had fired all of our public safety people our police chief, who was African-American, was the first Latino, Afro-Latino um, police chief, but yet our you know, interaction with the public was absolutely horrible. So in the midst of all that, I came in and we had this idea that we weren't gonna solve homicides and crime just by simply increasing the number of police officers, that we really should be focusing on social services, healthcare, job opportunities, transportation, all of these things <clears throat> that lead to interaction with policing. And I bring it up in context to Mayor Pratt's uh, conversation is that when I offered that to the community, the very communities where we had the, the, the interaction with African Americans and the police were the ones that were not in favor of it. Because what they wanted were more police on their streets because crime was happening in their neighborhoods, their children were being shot and they were right. 
Um, and people, returning citizens coming from jail were going in their communities. So I bring that up to say, as we look at these very difficult issues, yes, we have to do, and we did it, you have to reform our police department to make sure that they're serving, they're protect and serve. You know, they're not an occupying force, but at the same time, you have to pay attention to, you know, especially as an executive, what the community wants and what you need to, to provide to them. We ended up doing the things that I wanted, but what happened was in the first six months when crime went up, nobody liked the idea of shifting resources from the police to these social services that were gonna take a long time to, uh, uh, to see the fruits of that. So I think that's the difficult in adult conversation that we have to have beyond the marches. You know, that's the hard conversation that I think you're trying to have tonight. I would, um, I would say one of the key things that we get to do is uh, separate out the idea of public safety and law enforcement. That the idea that public safety is created by law enforcement is, is part of the problem. That public safety comes from so many different angles, from so many different places. And that when we, um, a lot of people fall into the trap of thinking that law enforcement and public safety are the same thing. Um, but the community has so much to say about what actually keeps them safe, what keeps our neighborhoods safe. And yes, I have to agree with Mr. Baker, um, in part because some of the most vulnerable people in most American cities, particularly large cities, some of the most vulnerable people to crime, to being shot and homicide are young men of color, particularly African American men, that they're the most vulnerable. And so people want things that will protect them um, and protect you know, the, the neighborhood. And in a world where we think public safety and law enforcement are the same thing, people call for law enforcement. Uh, one of the investments I made as mayor was in collaborative public safety strategies. It was sort of participatory budgeting meets public safety strategies where uh, Cities United, a great organization working on the national level to reduce violence um, among African-American men and boys, full disclosure, I'm a senior advisor, uh, came in and worked with me. I invested money in the two spots in the city where we had the most violent crime among youth. And we invited the neighbors in that area to submit their ideas about what they could do to create more safety. Neighbors decided which of those strategies to invest in, and then we as a city invested in those strategies. It's that kind of imagining of public safety that I think is possible. Uh, the fact that communities don't trust police departments, the fact that lots of people won't call the police for a variety of reasons, particularly immigrant communities uh, and African-American folks and indigenous folks, that creates less public safety. If you think law enforcement is, is all you can do for public safety, but you're not, you know, but whole swaths of your community won't call, pick up the phone and call the police, that makes everybody in the community less safe. So this reimagining of public safety, I think is important. Where that, that's where the mental health work comes in. That's where jobs and housing and transit and transportation, as Mr. Baker was talking about, um, all of that contributes to public safety. If people's lives are going well, they have more options. And when they have more options, they're less likely to choose the criminal option. Right. And um, I come to this as someone who's still in the midst of it um, uh, uh, as chair of the Civilian Complaint Review Board for the city of New York. Um, and so I want to advocate for more civilian oversight and say a little bit about our, our agency and how it works. And I want to advocate for police reform. So on civilian oversight, you know, we, we're an agency um, that uh, has about 200 employees, um, a bevy of lawyers and investigators. Uh, we have the ability to subpoena for evidence. So it's, I th we're the largest and probably the uh, strongest in some sense um, in the nation. And, we should be because we're trying to exercise at least some disciplinary oversight for the largest police department in the nation, 36,000 police officers and a budget of, of five to six billion dollars, depending on how much they decide to transfer to other things um, in this budget year. Um, uh, and, and 
uh, as an agency, we, we have a board and I chair that board. That board is appointed by the city council, the mayor, our public and our public advocate. Um, it has three representatives from the police department on it. They are retired uh, officers. Um, and we hear and adjudicate uh, cases, uh, complaints from citizens in the areas of force, abuse of authority, discourtesy, and offensive language. Uh, we probably get five to 6,000 cases that we can actually engage a year. And then we come up with, um, we decide if there's guilt or innocence or maybe the, the action that was complained about didn't happen or it did happen and we can't determine if it violated uh, police policy. Then we make a set of recommendations about penalties and um, disposition of cases to the, to the police commissioner and then the commissioner has a final authority. So we have a fairly, fairly robust civilian oversight agency in New York City, and I know that there are other robust agencies uh, around, around the country. But we need to do more to strengthen that civilian oversight, even in New York. So I am advocating that uh, our agency have final disciplinary authority. So rather than the commissioner receiving recommendations from the agency, what we recommend is what is. It, that becomes the final decision. And there's a growing support for that um, uh, in, the, in the city um, and beyond. Uh, we have that body-worn camera footage. Uh, we saw the footage, uh, video footage is crucial for good civilian oversight of policing and it becomes more and more important every day. Every one of those 35,000 officers in New York City now has a body-worn body camera. Our agency has access to that footage in our investigation of our cases, but we have access only through the department. So what we're advocating now is that um, we have unfettered and direct access to that camera footage um, and that we be able to, and that we use it as we do uh, in the investigations, but we get it more quickly, et cetera. We have a, within our agency, we have a prosecution unit. So we have lawyers who actually will take police officers to a departmental trial. And the most famous of those that we did was Officer Daniel Pantaleo, who um, strangled Eric Garner, uh, to choke Eric Garner to death in Staten Island. The district attorney of Staten Island took a pass on that case. The federal government took a pass on that case. And the only avenue at the end of the day for any justice for the Garner family was our civilian oversight board and the ability for that board to prosecute that case in the departmental trial. We got a guilty verdict from the judge. We got the departmental trial judge to agree that Officer Pantaleo should be fired. That was a recommendation that went to the police commissioner, former police commissioner O'Neill. And after much consideration, the police commissioner agreed with us and Officer Pantaleo was fired. But that prosecution unit is by, is by a memorandum of understanding only. So another area of change that we're advocating is that that unit be made permanent. That should be a model, I think, for the, for the nation. I think you could look at New York City, look at our civilian complaint review board, what's working well, and then what needs to be done to um, strengthen its oversight. And those three things I think would go a long way in doing that. Let me just say a word about police reform and, and then I'll stop. And that is, I think that uh, we need to do a great deal more uh, in ensuring that there's more uniformity in how we decide who's gonna be a policeman. So what we're advocating for in New York is that we have a statewide uh, authority. A group of social service agencies are gonna probably, and advocates are going to release this week, uh, probably tomorrow, um, a set of recommendations. Among them will be that we have um, a statewide board with authority to certify all officers in the state, uh, that we prohibit the hiring of officers uh, in other jurisdictions once they've been fired from one jurisdiction, particularly if there's a history of excessive force or, or serious uh, misconduct complaints. Uh, there should be mandatory annual training for all officers in diversity and equity, inclusion, community relations, de-escalation and violence reduction strategies, uh, and preventing uh, racial and ethnic, religious and discriminatory profiling. 
we're going to advocate that, you know, we prohibit officers uh, to coming to any precinct until they've done community relations training. And then finally, that we require all officers who are deployed in any uh, precinct to have an introductory two, two week period to that precinct, engaging all the key players in the precinct, et cetera. So I think civilian oversight is crucial. And then these reforms and how we go about deciding who's going to be a police officer and what they're going to do once they become an officer, I think would go a long way in helping to improve the relationship between police and com the communities that they've been hired to serve. Thank you all very much. You know, as, as you were talking about all of these different changes that need to take place, um, as elected officials and being involved with budgeting, we've had conversations um, in our previous conversations as well as offline conversations where we've had even police representatives who have said there's some responsibilities within the performance of their duties they would rather not do. Right. Why, why is it so hard? Help us out to, to shift funds or to reallocate or to reform. Um, you know, we've got many out there who are wondering about that, but as, as we've talked offline and we're talking now, you all are in the room and bring this experience. Please give us the understand why is it so difficult to take funds as some, and we've got a very hot term now, defunding, which in some ways has been reallocating. But from all of your perspectives, please un help us to know why it's so difficult to shift funds when we all agree that work needs to be somewhere else. And, and please, wh whoever can help us understand, jump in here. Well, I think one thing is that, I, I, you know, um, I think all of us agreed that that money needs to be spent. I did it as well. I had to almost, you know, had to beg, steal, and borrow to get the money uh, to engage, you know, in terms of a lot of preventative outreach and social services. Uh, but the reality of it is, is by and large, elected officials, not just the e executive, but also you have other branches of government, you have short timelines in which you have tenure right. and you quickly have to be answerable to the public and they have they don't always have a lot of patience and if they they, they don't always say oh believe that you know well that's a great idea but the returns on that investment are probably down the road i think a step to getting us closer to that uh, so that the public is more accepting is try more aggressively to thread together those social services programs with the police department. Whatever you can put together in those social services programs, try to thread it together with the police department. But that really requires a lot of uh, reorienting uh, of, of one's thinking mm -hmm. philosophy. You've got to get a lot of buy-in. We did make an effort to do that, but it constantly required me weighing in all the time because right. you were fighting a system that where everybody functioned in silos. And in order to get them to work in a collaborative way, I almost always had to be in the room. But you know, that's all but impossible if you're the elected official. But that was the only way I could get them to do it. And it isn't just police and social services. It needs to be the courts, education. All of them have to be in, in yeah. the group at the same time. No, if, if I could just say, I mean, <clears throat> I've been out of office probably about a year and a half, two years, and I feel still the weight, feel still the weight of having to do that. You know, when we talk about, you know, the reason, one of the things is I like the fact that people are saying defund the police, because at least we can then start having the conversation that Mira Hodges talked about of those other things. Because if somebody had said defund the police back in 2010, when I was shifting resources, at least I got to have an adult conversation. Because what happens is, and Mayor Pratt is right, there are council members, there are community groups, there's everybody who is saying, I need my problem solved immediately. And so you're coming in here, and we did this, saying that we're going to invest in healthcare to make sure that we have a number of, we have African Americans and Latinos in our community that didn't have health care. We're going to provide health care. We're going to raise the minimum wage. We're going to provide transportation, job training. All of it's going to work out, but we're going to take that money and put it in here, you know, in these areas, in these social services, 
and we're going to give you a 311 so you don't call the police on 911 and have an interaction. It took two years before people would use the 311. If somebody illegally dumped their trash, they called 911. They called the police if their lights were out. And so, and then what happens is council members and state legislators start saying, well, I want, you know, the police to respond quicker. Response time became an issue. Um, I don't want the healthcare worker going in there. They need the police to go in there. So it's, it's, it's to me, really, it's saying to the community, two things I think is important is, what are you willing to give up and what are you willing to pay for? Because those are the two questions you need to ask on any of these. What are you willing to give up? And what are you willing to pay for? Even in body cameras. We could have everybody in Prince George's County with body cameras. But guess what? That's the health budget I just spent on body cameras. You know, that's the social service that I just spent. That's the social workers and health care that we have in our schools to deal with mental and, and behavioral health. You know, so if I ask for more money, nobody wants to be taxed for. So those are the questions I think we have to, you know, to, to answer and to ask. Mayor Hodges, you, you were visually affirming some of what <laughs> Mr. Baker was saying. Do you want to jump in here? Um, I, and I think I, I appreciate everything that my colleagues and fellow panelists have said here, and it's all part and parcel of it. Part of the challenge, as far as I can tell, the biggest barrier to any progressive change around racial equity in America's cities is white resistance. Mm -hmm. uh, and it almost never looks like, and it's usually white people on the left, um, and it almost never looks like white people saying, I don't want people of color to succeed. It, it almost never looks like we're saying, uh, I just prefer my comfort to your livelihood or your well-being. Um, but that's what it often comes down to, and we find different ways to say it. Um, and But the impact is the same. And that plays out in city. Nobody likes change, first of all. Um, and when it's around racial equity, which is a lot of what most of what the conversation about policing is, when it's around a racial equity, it has a particular charge for white people. And uh, though nobody likes change, and so there are battles you have to wage within city hall with staff who don't necessarily want to change. They aren't consciously, white staff in particular, aren't consciously thinking, oh, I want this to fail. They're just thinking, ah, that sounds like a lot of work. Um, I'll, you know, and there's all sorts of ways people have inside City Hall, but it's the constituencies. You know, if, if the constituents who elected elected officials decided en masse that they really wanted something to be different, that they wanted the outcomes for people of color in those systems to be different rather than just feeling less bad about racism while maintaining our comfort, those systems would change. And in, mo in a lot of cities, the, the constituents who are most silent or most resistant are, the, are, are, are white middle class and upper class folks. Uh, who just say, time out, no way. Um, and, and again, it, 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 it looks like people are saying, well, that's bad for business. Oh, that's, that'll raise my taxes. Oh, that's too tough. Oh, why are we focusing on this? Because really the change needs to happen over here, but it's a constant game of past, you know, it's, it's a three card Monty. You never pick up the right thing to change the system that people are gonna agree to. And, and so I, I agree with what panelists have said, and I also just have to note, and, and, and uh, that's the, I wrote a piece in the New York Times about this in July, uh, often the biggest barrier to change are white liberals in cities who we want to feel better about race, but we don't wanna be thrust into the discomfort of actually changing how we live our lives to get it. And so I would add that, that's part of the reason. What's happening in the room where it happens, as you were talking about, Reverend, is 
the pressures of what are our constituents saying, how much political room has been created to make real change. And protest creates a lot of political room, but protest from both sides does that. Pressure from any angle does that. And for any given elected official, they're gonna have to weigh how far can we go with this against what will my constituents be able to handle and am I willing to lose my job for this? So let's go ahead, please, Mr. Beatty. No, go ahead. Well, I, I was going to sort of keep us moving on this question of constituents, right? Because one of the things that happens, and I feel it sometimes too, when I'm thinking about politics and engaging as I've never been an elected official, but I've been an activist, I've been a community member who cares and has been part of it. And it sometimes can feel like a battle, right? When the truth is that we're actually all living in these places together. And, and the more we can figure out how to live together <laughs> instead of fighting about living together, uh, then, he, then we can make progress of some sort, right? So um, Mayor Hodges, thank you for what you noted about where there is resistance. Um, Mr. Davey, you started us down this path around the Civilian Review Board, right? The role of the community. So, so I wanna take this a little bit further and ask you all to talk about how community members can be helpful Right? Like what are the, and there's a myriad of ways that community members and citizens can, can step in from very official and some would say bureaucratic ways, such as the review, review complaint board, right? And all of those processes. And citizens are engaged in the streets. That's one form of citizen engagement. And there are, I would love to hear from, from those of you who are inside that system and have spent time there what is the most useful thing that, or the most useful things that we can be doing to be positive, proactive participants in moving towards the, the society that we're asking for? And in particular, I'm hearing the tension between um, funding this versus funding this versus funding it so that we can have community safety. What are the ways in which we can assist those people who are in elected office or working in City Hall. Let me add a little bit to that question as well and press, because I want to hear that same piece. That is, we're talking about individuals. Please look at that as if there are uh, segments of the community. And the fact that we're having the conversation here, if there are expectations of the faith community please, yes. that you see, please address that as well. How do we get involved? Or when you, we, if you had expectations, uh, which is wonderful, and we all want to hear, help help us. And what what should we be looking at? Well, there's some big issues. Uh, I, part of the challenge, I think, for all of the panelists here is that we're all operating at a municipal level, and so therefore, to a great extent, how we redistribute resources. Yes, having collaboration and the support of the community and the uh, faith community, you know, pushing us to consider it, all of that's a huge plus. But I think we've got to also recognize that a lot of what we're dealing with at a municipal level is a reflection of a much larger dynamic in our country where, I mean, you know, sort of to borrow from Bernie Sanders, I mean, the, you know, or Warren, the enormous income inequality that is growing in our society. A lot of the dynamics we see here at the municipal level, at the local level, are just, again, a, a, a fallout from that, just a fallout from it. And so, I mean, unless you would begin to address these larger issues that are really very threatening to our notions of democracy, we see it played out in the politics of 2020. But whoever you're for, a lot of it is a, a notions, that are in a reflection, an expression of the economic polarization that exists in America, the inability to come together uh, because we don't share the same vested interest any longer in, in the way we have in the past. So anybody who addresses any of these issues and raises our consciousness and encourages us to constructively think about it, because by and large, we don't think about it. We think we've done our job by going and voting and we're done with it. I mean, part of what we've heard from a lot of elected officials lately is 
No, you haven't. You aren't done with it. You have responsibility as a citizen to stay engaged and stay involved. Mm -hmm. And that's what's so exciting about these young people out on the streets. They are forcing us. Now, maybe if we didn't have COVID, we wouldn't have noticed it so much. But they are forcing us to really recognize that they are impatient with where we are. I think that, again, that we have a much larger issue in our society, a much more threatening polarization in our society that, again, expresses itself at a local level and very particularly in the criminal justice. Mm -hmm. But any conversation such as this one, I think, helps us immeasurably. Yeah, I think, um, you know, to, to, to add on to what Mayor Pratt says and Mayor Hodges, you know, I think about, especially, you know, what Mayor Hodges said in her article about, and it is, it's those liberal elite communities that are in the communities that we live in. So it's not just, I can tell you, it's not just cities, it's counties. You know, we have a very diverse county. Um, but the thing that, and, and this gets to Mayor Pratt's point, the thing is, those communities know how to access government to make it work. So yes, they vote. But when something goes wrong, I can tell you, if I went to a part of our county and there was something wrong in there, they didn't wait for the community meeting. They didn't wait for the budget to come through. They had the tools and knowledge to come in and access government to make it work. And so one of the things that I wanted to do when we changed how we did things in the county was, we focused exclusively on those challenging communities that don't and know how to access government. And the way you do that is you actually bring government to them and community. We use the faith community, community leaders, but we also use those local businesses in those challenging areas to teach them how to call the Department of Housing, to call you know, public, public works. These things that we need that once they finish voting, that when they saw something wrong in their community, they could actually change it in real time that government can work for them, that they don't have to wait into a community meeting or into a march. You know, one of the things I hope happens out of this march is that those folks go back in and really start accessing how to, the, the government works. So you can shift funds. So it isn't one part of the community saying, well, I don't want you to shift the resources to the challenging areas and forgetting about us or I don't want you raising my taxes when 90% of the money is gonna to go to places other than where I live. But unless those communities know how to access government, how to make it work, then you could have progressive leaders that come on and are mayors and county executives. And once they leave, things will go back to it because those communities, those elite communities that we talk about, um, those well-educated communities, know how to work government. And that's what you see change happens. And we've got to make sure the other part gets paid attention to and they know how to access government and make the changes that they want for their lives. Mr. Mr. Davey, you, you, and I appreciate everybody, but I'm going to come to you on this one because what I really hear everybody saying is it's on us. Um, us being the listeners and being the citizens and all. You know, are, because you're working with the civilians and trying to get persons involved, talk to us about what you see. Is there a willingness or is that a struggle? Or how do you go about getting persons to really get involved with the system um, as you see it? So I want to make a, a couple of other points before, um, and, I'll, and I'll address that as well. Please. When it, I, you know, when it comes to, um, so let's take this case of um, white society and its power. That power rests and resides in certain entities. And when it comes to policing, one of the places where it rests is with police unions that are primarily run by white men who represent a particular sector of uh, white society uh, and generally a pretty powerful sector. And they have a considerable sway over elected officials as representatives of that 
power sector or those power sectors of society. New York City, our PBA, which is the largest of the police unions, just endorsed Donald Trump for mayor. In liberal New York City, where we have majority minority, where majority people of color residents, majority people of color now patrol on the streets in our, in our department. But yet our, our, the, the, the police union and the unions, because there are others, the SBA and the, and the Captain's Association, et cetera, will considerable power on behalf of an entrenched power structure. Uh, so it's important to, to address that. Now, how it's getting addressed is to your question, is that people first, they try to make these systems work on their behalf. So you get leaders from uh, communities of color, minority communities, poor communities. We have a great chair of the Public Safety Committee. I think he's 36, 38 years old, just, just been elected the bar president of Queens. Um, well, not quite. He's been, he's a Democratic nominee for the position and he'll run, uh, he'll run again in November, but his opposition is minimal. But he's a great guy. And he's really, um, he has really deep rooted principles. He's rooted in the community. But he, he has pushed the city um, in ways uh, that many people would have been afraid to push the department been very public uh, about challenging the department. He's been very public about the reallocation of resources so that the department is not doing things that, that it should be doing. The citizens of his community, of his councilmanic district, support him in, that, in those efforts. And he feels empowered to do them because those people are, those people of his community, now the people of the city, are behind him in that work. The CCRB, we reach out to everybody. We reach out to faith, we have a, we have a outreach and intergovernmental uh, affairs unit within the agency. So we're in regular contact with community board organizations, community leaders, regular contact with faith leaders um, in, the, in the city, uh, and regular contact with other types of local um, uh, groups and associations. And every other month, we have a public meeting. Uh, before COVID, we would actually go out to one of the boroughs in a community facility somewhere. Generally, it was a public housing project and their community room and we would open it up and we would say, come tell us what's going on between you and the police and how we can help improve that relationship. And it's proved a powerful thing. We have a youth advisory council, young people and a, a great PSA on the, on the CCRB website, I'd encourage you to look at it, that young people put together about what it means to have an unpleasant interaction with a New York City police officer and how the CCRB is an avenue to addressing that unpleasantness and, and what the result of that is. Now, the people who come to our agency and make complaints, they come with a lot of issues themselves. So we've tried, to, we've been working on a, a complainants and witness assistance unit. So that when somebody comes and make a complaint and they have mental health issues or rent arrears issues or other issues related to just their daily existence, then we'll able to help them do that. And we do it because we can't effectively engage the police if the witnesses or the complainants disappear. And they often disappear because they have other issues. So we've taken, the agency's taken this comprehensive effort to engage the public. Um, we have uh, elected officials who come from those communities who are willing to stand up and push an agenda. Um, and, and we have faith leaders and everyone else that want to be a part of that mix. And I think, and, and, and the young people in the streets. So I think all of those things coming together, channeled in the right direction, uh, with some really practical approaches to how we want to do things, those things I talked about before, I think can, can, really, can really lead to change. And we're seeing some of that change actually happen now in how we do policing um, in New York City. The, the, these, these the power is entrenched. Uh, as you're saying, and we're shifting these, it's very difficult, as I said, to turn that ship in the middle of the ocean, but we're all trying to turn it in this moment. 
Um, and so being able to, to get individuals involved, what I very much appreciate, um, and I know uh, if I'm correct, um, our program directors, we've got to move to questions, but um, the time is going so quickly. I, I do want to say I very much appreciate um, how in your conversations, not only are you all um, giving us better insight to some of the uh, difficulties and pieces that are at work here, but also challenging us uh, to be involved, that it's not just looking up and expecting the changes to happen, but it's looking within that we might be part of the change that needs to happen. So I, I want to thank you all. We've got a, a list of questions and I, I'm going to uh, program that. Do you want to kick us off with the first question or? Um, Happy to do that. Um, I also am really appreciative of, uh, of the conversation here tonight. I'm, I'm struck by the difference between tonight and Tuesday night in the sense that we are, um, Tuesday night felt more, uh, abstract is not the right word, but it, it felt more, it felt larger. It felt more, um, more about the ideas around policing change and more about the, the passion behind the calls for change and the ways that people were feeling about the importance of it. And it, and it feels reflective tonight that the, it is one thing to have that kind of passion and motivation and it is a different thing to sit in the rooms where you're moving one person at a time or moving a, a system of people or systems of dollars to, to shift. And I, I want to notice that because I think that sometimes those of us who, who join politics in the, our first experiences are either in the streets or about a particular issue for, with which we feel great passion because it, we or people we love are, just, are deeply impacted by it, right? And we see the solution and we want to get there. And so I, I'm noticing that difference with gratitude for the, the folks who do that that day-to-day -day lift. And um, and, and one of the questions that I love that's come in, I'm going to make it be connected because I wanted to say that and I want to ask the question. So, <laughs> so it's, um, I think I'm going to name, the question is, how do we lead people who think this is someone else's problem into the understanding that all of us are complicit? And, and I think that question is, a, it's a tough question, right? Because some of us sit in places where we don't think that the problem of policing is our problem. And, and I was saying um, before the, the call actually started tonight that as I move more deeply into a conversation about community safety and, and learn more about how community safety, as Mayor Hodges was say, saying earlier, is bigger than law enforcement, that I also have a responsibility to participate in creating safety in my communities. And that might not be just from voting or participating in a, a, a formal way, but it might just be by knowing my neighbors or being willing to, to somebody walked through our alley yesterday and took a bicycle right out of somebody's yard before we could yell at them. And, and watching that happen and feeling complicit and not stepping in more quickly, right? So I think this question about complicity is, is complicated and personal and also really, really important about inviting people into our own responsibility. And I am curious if you all have stories about people you've watched learn to take on more responsibility, what that might have looked like in your own experience and um, how we can help one another do that, right? How do, we, how do we do that with one another in a manner of community that will get us somewhere. Well, this is a start. I mean, having this conversation, uh, you know, hosted by, by the cathedral is a start and uh, inviting others to participate in the conversation. But getting involved with neighborhood organizations, I, that's, you know, I'm a big believer in that, civic organizations, so that that countervailing point of view is heard. The reason that, and I don't, I don't mean, I know people have really targeted the police, I'm not trying to dump on them, but I had the similar experiences with the Fraternal Order of Police, uh, you know, as uh, Frederick has had in New York. 
uh, that, you know, they would tell me, I've got the gun on my hip. What are you going to do? <laughs> so, I said, well, I've got the authority to take the badge off your chest. But, you know, it wasn't exactly a good way to begin a conversation. But, but be, they feel they have more power because that power has gone unchallenged. And it isn't just because they're the fraternal order police. It's because that approach, that sort of John Wayne approach of preserving law and order, uh, which is also a hierarchical system of who has value in our society. I mean, that's implicit in all of that. Uh, until there's a countervailing point of view and that there's a real chorus of a countervailing point of view. That's what begins to change it. And that is that is what is occurring in America. We're hearing the countervailing point of view, uh, but we do still have that tension with sort of John Wayne point of America. So, so that all helps. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, for, for me, you know, it's not that people don't acknowledge there's a, there's a problem. Uh, you'll have people who are in communities that aren't, that are less challenged, that aren't as challenged as some of those in our, in our county. I never had them say, well, you know, I, I understand we're all in it together. And I'd be like, great. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to shift the resources that you normally get, because we have a small budget. We're going to shift those down to these areas that are challenging for their schools, for their jobs, for the transportation, for the community engagement with police. That's when they said, whoa, 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 I didn't mean that. I mean, I acknowledge that they have problems and I'm part of it. I want to help solve the problem for all of us. Well, that's impossible for any elected official. I guarantee you the mayors will agree with me. Your budget is very well set. There isn't, you know, nobody's giving you any extra money. So when you decide that some, you have these challenging areas and you want to shift resources, you know, that's when it's not my problem. I've got to make sure my community is safe. Or when the FOP goes to the folks that you said, you know what, we're not going to put, we're not going to build, and, and this happened to me, we're not going to build a police station, which you didn't have to staff, in an area that is like the safest area in the Washington metropolitan area. But the FOP went and said, you know what, there's a casino coming down the road and you guys are gonna have people robbing your homes, jacking your cars, and guess what? Every council member came back to me and said, nope, we're building it. It made no sense. I said, you, we just got out of a consent decree. You're gonna have more police interacting with more black people and everybody voted for it. So what I'm saying with what we need is when people acknowledge that they understand it, they also have to acknowledge what they're going to give up yeah. and the willingness to go back to their constituents and say, you know what, for the greater good, we're shifting it here because if we make these communities empower them and make them safer, it's going to help all of us. That's what I want to hear people say is not that you acknowledge it, not that you, you know, I love it when people say Black Lives Matter. Okay, let's prove it. Put your money where your mouth is. Let me shift some of that resources to those schools down there. That's when I'll know Black Lives really matter because you paid it with your budget. You're here. I think the thing that gives me a little bit of hope, maybe a lot of hope here, <laughs> is the uh, is the multiracial, multi ethnic um, um, composition of the of the protesters and the consistent way in which they've done that. And if you think about what sparked this, um, it was George Floyd for sure. That was a horrific, horrific display of not only police abuse, but some form of white power and white privilege and rank unadulterated racism. But the other thing that happened right at that same time was the young woman in Central Park, a regular, everyday white woman who decided that she was going to weaponize this guy's race against him. And I think the, every black person and brown person and many other people of color can recognize that. But I think a whole lot of white people 
and other folks recognized what was going on there too. That underneath this veneer, or even this commitment to a more progressive agenda, still lies a lot of unexamined racism. And the minute things go wrong, where is the fault? The default is your boy, and I'm going to show you your boy, and here's how I'm going to do it. That and that resonated with folks. That resonated with a lot of people who said, I don't want to be a part of that anymore, particularly young people. I don't want that to represent me. I don't want that to be who I am. And so they've taken to the streets consistently, mainly focused on the abuses of law enforcement, which they should, but I also think it's a proxy for a lot of other sort of racist expressions in, in our society and the stuff that lies deep within that, that, that now it's time for us, you know, to kind of deal with in a, in a real way. So, um, so the fact that, these, that this multicultural, multiracial group of young people has taken to the streets and they stay out there. Now, now I realize that some of these protests have been hijacked by folks who shouldn't be doing what they're doing, et cetera. But the fact that they're staying out there um, the, we had a, in New York City, we had, the, speaking of the unions, they took us to court, took CCRB and the ACLU to court uh, over release of disciplinary records. Uh, ACLU won today, I expect us to win tomorrow. But the young people were in, in, in federal court. The young people were out in the streets. They were organizing. We want to tell the court, I mean, just today, we're going to tell in the courts, you know, what should happen when it comes to making police disciplinary records public. Um, and they didn't, they didn't, they, multiracial, multi-ethnic got out there and organized so the courts could hear their voice. Fortunately, they won um, and I hope we win tomorrow. So that gives me hope. That gives me hope that, that we're gonna, that we're gonna, that, we're, that, you know, that we have people who want to step into this and, and really do something. Now, I agree with the mayors. Um, when that transfer translates also, also into budgets that are more, you know, that, that really meet people's needs, you know, um, then we'll get closer. You know, when we get that universal basic income, then we know we've yeah. made a lot of progress. <laughs> one of the, one of the, tricks of whiteness since the civil rights movement has been layering on top of generations of history with white people with us not seeing what whiteness is or how race operates and if we do see it not for many years for generations not caring but since the civil rights movement, what we layered on top of that is, is, is convincing white people that racism is simply a, 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 a personal feeling and uh, interpersonal behaviors. And racism plays out in our hearts and it plays out in those interpersonal reaction, interactions, but racism is the systems that we're talking about. Racism, it's, it's not just policing, it's, it's all of our social systems in this country were predicated and based on race and racism and on white superiority. And so for the, I mean, my message to my, my sibling white people is that by not understanding that the systems are set up for us, they're set up very well for m most of us, particularly those of us who are middle class and upper class, the systems are set up for us. And so we're not going to see policing the same way as people for whom uh, it is set up very differently. It's, it's our comfort with policing is built on the discomfort of people of color with policing. Those two, it was policing, uh, as we talked about in the beginning, policing was set up to preserve our comfort and to preserve our property. And at the time, our property were considered people, which is as inhuman and inhumane a concept as there is. Policing was set up to defend that, and it is still set up to defend that because we haven't changed the goal of the system. We've just changed how we see it and how we think about it. And so by not understanding that, 
by not first admitting to ourselves, yes, that is true, that's how it works. We, the police are protecting me from understanding how other things in other parts of, our, of my community work. We are complicit. And until we put our shoulder to the wheel of changing what policing is for, not just how it functions, but why it functions. Until we say policing shouldn't be just for me, policing should be about community safety and we should decide as a full community what we want community safety to be uh, and what role, if any, law enforcement should or could play in that. Until we are in that conversation in a real way and we're deeply uncomfortable, we are complicit. That is my message to my fellow white people. And this whiteness, we were socialized into it. We didn't start off as, as white people. We didn't start off with this huge dose of whiteness, although we were born into it immediately. Um, there's a human being under there and that our humanity fully understands that this system is wrong. It's why on the left, we're so deeply, deeply uncomfortable um, and why we look to be more comfortable. But the goal is not comfort. The goal is actually change. And what do we have to do to support that change. And so when you asked earlier, what can we do as communities of faith? Right now, faith communities are the only keepers of a framework that white people can use to talk to each other from a place of compassion and love as human beings first and accountability second, that it's okay to talk about whiteness and, and the frailty of our humanity and to understand that there are things we can do about that. Uh, Communities of spirit of all kinds are right now the best keepers of that framework. And I would use that to invite people to keep our human white people to keep our humanity while we look at the whiteness that's been layered on top of it, which means there's something in it for us to do this work. It's not just a question of what are we going to give up? It's also a question of what are we going to gain and what we gain and what we reclaim from, from, from engaging in racial equity work ourselves is we get that humanity back, which is really what we're so defensive about to begin with. We're not going to lose anything. We're just going to get something back. It's a reclamation project. You know, I, I want to thank you, Mayor Hodges. Um, because you, you are going right into, the time is moving quickly here, but you're going right into a question that was really posed to me, very direct, which I wanted to get to, and you may need to follow up as I, I put this before everyone. They really wanted to know, as elected officials, um, what were your expectations, or even as former elected officials, what did you believe that the role of the church should be in this issue and, at, and helping out um, when we talk about making this change in the heart of mind. And, and certainly um, we, we're looking forward to hear, we, we've got, of course, Mr. Davey, who's, who's at the seminary even right now um, and dealing with, so we're all interested in this, but I thought it was very interesting that you were going there. I was holding this question, um, waiting for you to, to ask this, but we've got a very direct question that as elected officials, which is a very unique perspective, what role did you expect the church to play? Um, and even from your personal uh, looking now, what role would you say the church should be playing? Well, the church should help us le with leading the conversation. Um, and really to heighten the point that Mayor Hodges just raised, that we have a, our own sense of humanity ought to be the guiding light for what we do. Not just think of it in terms of, you know, immediate, more secular quid pro quos, but to identify the notion of our humanity, which in this environment, you know, you have to believe that the Lord is at work because we all thought, we could create walls and not we all thought, but you know, we could have walls separate ourselves and do this and that. And with one stroke, with one pathogen, you know, suddenly we all recognized that we were interconnected. There wasn't a wall that could separate us. I mean, throughout the globe. And it has everybody's attention full time. I mean, what else could have quite have done that? You almost have to believe as horrible as this virus is, it's almost like the Lord is at work to get our attention. Uh, 
and in this environment, I think we're more open to having conversations about our collective humanity uh, and how that is also, not just also, very much at stake. So we need the church to play a role uh, in, in guiding us and uh, especially around such a conversation. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I know for me, um, when I was running and, you know, and everybody, politician visits every church. And in Prince George's County, we've got mega churches out here. So, um, but I would say to, you know, the pastors is that, you know, I understand the problems of distrust with our police department. And I'm going to be back here once I'm county executive to, to work with you. Um, and we actually did it, but we did it for, I would say, a very selfish reason. And that is the faith community in these challenging areas where, we had the highest level of incidents with police and, um, and African-Americans, they were trusted. And so we needed to get with the church to bring us together, to talk about on the long-term what we wanna see happen in this relationship and how to build trust between the community, the police and government. And only the faith community could do that because they were the honest brokers. I couldn't do it as a politician because the public was like, well, everybody who's running for office says the same thing. Last guy said that, where, why are you different? They certainly don't believe the police, but the honest broker, and that's what the faith community is doing tonight, but it's what it has to do throughout is be that honest broker. And not only in the policing issue, um, you know, while I got this last second, also in education and housing. Because we really can't talk about us as a community changing this when we live in different places and our kids go to different schools. So having the faith community, we saw some of this, you know, in my time where, you know, faith community would come and talk about public schools and getting more money, even though they had their own parochial, they had their own, you know, uh, schools. They were concerned about the constituents. So I think that's the role they can play or you can play and bringing us together around these issues nobody really wants to talk about. And I'll just jump in quickly because I Please. know we're running out of time. Um, at Union Seminary, we have a Union Theological Seminary in New York City. We have a tagline that says, um, we're where uh, scholarship and faith meet to reimagine the work of justice. Um, and so I think for that means that we are in the, process, in the business of creating leaders uh, who take heart and mind and go out and try to really reorder uh, how, we, how we interact and relate to each other um, in the world. Mayor Hodges sounded like a theologian to me when she was talking about <laughs> faith being the sort of holder of that frame for how people can, uh, if just to paraphrase, uh, and I may get it wrong, but sort of uh, connect to their humanity underneath that, that outer core. And, how, and it's a frame where a safe conversation can actually begin to happen. And, and take place. Um, uh, I believe that the, the, that the, particularly the African American faith community has been providing uh, a frame where the justice conversation can take place. And, and, and it's been doing that since that church was nothing but, you know, a few people, uh, illiterate people, uneducated people gathering in the hush harbors of the, of the plantations away from the master so that they could have conversations about the ways in which the Lord was speaking to their hearts and speaking a word of justice. Um, and, and, and in the midst of the most horrendous conditions, never gave up on, 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 on the desire to be free because underneath that external stuff was the same humanity that's underneath this stuff that, uh, that, that, that we call whiteness. So, so the, 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 the church holds these frames that, 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 um, that, that call us to look at the divinity um, and, the, and the humanness um, of, of, of all people. And when we get this thing, when we get the thing so, so wrong, I mean like really wrong, the church is there, even when it's getting it wrong, getting it wrong, the scriptures are there, the traditions are there to call us back. Uh, just one more quick word and that is, when you look at someone talked about, um, and I think it was Mayor Pratt, about this thing being more than transactional, more than quid pro quo. What the evangelicals have done as a body, and there are exceptions, um, 
but as a body, is to turn faith into just that, a transactional relationship, quid, quid quo quo. You give, quid quo quo, you give me um, uh, these two or three things, and I'll forget about children in cages, I'll forget about poverty, I'll forget about uh, police brutality, I'll forget about what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with your God. You give me these things, you can talk about raping women, sexually assaulting women, and I'll forget about that. That kind of transactional quid pro quo is just what faith shouldn't be. And right now, those frames of justice and equity are standing in judgment on that transactional relationship that has been created by a whole group of believers with a power structure. And I believe in the end that that, that, that frame of justice and mercy and compassion is going to win out. Can we say amen and good work? <laughs> I, uh, Mr. Davey, thank you. I want to um, offer, I think we have a minute or two more. If there's anything on your hearts that you haven't said, particularly about this, this last piece feels important. Well, I think when you have a, a, a wonderful conclusion such as we've just heard, I think the only thing to say is amen. Mayor <laughs> yeah. Hodge just got me started. That's right. <laughs> Well, the, the only thing I would add to that, amen, is um, a, a heartfelt thank you for the, the four of you, for the, the work that you have done, the work that you continue to do, the reminder that each of you is that uh, this, this work is both inspiring, it's also challenging, and, and that we, we do it together. Right, and, and that it's conversations like this that we get to be connected across across the work in different municipalities, right? In different places and to remember that we are all part of one, one body, speaking of the, the faith traditions, right? We're part of one body that is a, about moving us to a, a just society, a place where um, that you all described so very beautifully at the beginning of our conversation. So um, with, with real gratitude from Dean Hollerith, from myself, from the, the cathedral staff, and, uh, I, and we're, we're all just so pleased and hope that those of you who are listening tonight and asking such great questions will continue to be engaged in your own communities. We'll be reaching out. We're, we're very curious actually to know how you who are listening put to work some of the things that you're learning here, right? What, what in a couple of weeks um, has stuck with you? Our panelists have said some really profound and wonderful and inspirational things tonight uh, that I hope will help us all to find our ways as we continue to, to do the work. So um, Canon Hamlin, it's always a pleasure to work with you. And, and one of the things I take great pleasure in are the prayers that you offer. So if you would um, offer any final words uh, that you may have and, oh, sorry, wait, I forgot one more thing. Folks who are listening. Um, we know this is a rough time for lots of communities financially. And we very much hope that if you have resources to, to spare that you are first supporting your own communities, right? Finding the people and the places and the institutions that are closest to your hearts and ensuring that you can be generous with them. And in that same vein, if the cathedral is a place that is close to your heart, if the, the work that we are doing feels important to you, um, we would love for you to share whatever resources, large or small, you have um, with us so we can continue this work too. And I think our, our fabulous team, Margaret and Caitlin, thank you for helping make all this go smoothly behind the scenes. One of them will drop a link into the chat um, if you're so moved to help us out financially. And, and with that, um, it wouldn't me church if we didn't ask you for money or for a gift of your, <laughs> your talent. So, um, closing out with a prayer and some final words from Canon Hamlin. Well, let me say uh, I join with uh, Michelle and saying thank you all tonight for uh, coming to the table and helping us to have a, a conversation that uh, as we were aiming is both in, in informational as well as uh, directional uh, and also inspiring. Um, and so thank you very much for being with us on this evening. And you have uh, challenged us all, I believe, to think about that just like this program, 
it takes all of us working together to make it come about. And, and so I hope that we will all go away doing our parts on this evening uh, to make the society and the communities in which we live, work, worship, and, re uh, and carry out all of our life that we will all be working to make them all better place. So I invite everyone, uh, those who are inclined as well, uh, to join me in a word of prayer. And in our closing, this is a prayer that many know I share so often, but the words are so inspiring. And they're a prayer that was offered by Mary McLeod Bethune. So won't you join me? Father, we call thee Father because we love thee. We are glad to be called thy children and to dedicate our lives to the service that extends through willing hearts and hands to the betterment of all mankind. We send a cry of thanksgiving for all people, races, creeds, classes, and colors the world over. And pray that through the instrumentality of our lives, the spirit of peace, joy, fellowship, and brotherhood shall circle the world. We know that the world is filled with discordant notes, but help us, Father, to so unite our efforts that we may all join in one harmonious symphony for peace, brotherhood, justice, equality, and opportunity for all people. The tasks that we have performed today and throughout our days, with forgiveness for all of our errors, we dedicate, dear Lord, to thee. Grant us strength and courage and faith and humility sufficient for the tasks that are assigned to us. This we ask in your name. Amen. 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 Thank, Thank you. you all so much. Panelists, you. do you want to hang out for a few minutes after folks leave? And, uh, be okay, sure. Presence.